When we translate Latin, one of the most common challenges is determining where one clause or idea starts and the next begins. This is important because you can only use words from one clause to translate that clause, not words from another clause. For the ancient Romans, separating clauses would have been even more difficult. They did not have the benefit of punctuation to help them separate clauses. For example, in this inscription, the dots separate the words and abbreviations from each other, not clauses. Modern editors add punctuation to Latin text to help us understand where one clause stops and one clause begins. Let's look at the transcription of this inscription. From the periods, we can see that one clause ends after the Roman numeral XLV for 45, and another begins with Militawit. So, how do modern editors understand where to put this punctuation? What if an editor is not as helpful and uses only a few punctuation marks? How can we tell where one clause stops and another begins? Latin has several clues to help readers separate its clauses. After all, Cicero's audience needed to understand his speech without looking at a script with punctuation. These clues are 1. A relatively standard subject, object, verb, word order. So a verb is often a clue that a clause is ending. 2. That a clause ends where the thought or idea ends. And 3. Clear indications of subordinate and coordinate clauses. So, what are subordinate clauses and coordinate clauses? Well, first, what is a clause? A clause is an idea that is communicated with a subject and a verb. In English, we need two words for this. She runs. She is the subject and runs is the verb. In Latin, this can be one word, curit. There can be multiple clauses in one sentence. Okay, so now what are subordinate clauses and coordinate clauses? A subordinate clause is a clause that depends on a main clause, and it tells us more about the main clause. It cannot stand on its own. For example, she runs when her mother calls. When her mother calls is the subordinate clause. It qualifies when she runs, and it cannot stand on its own. It needs a main clause. A coordinate clause is a clause that can stand on its own and is equal to another clause in the sentence. She runs, and she is happy. She runs, and she is happy are two coordinate clauses. Both can stand on their own as perfectly understandable sentences. You may have noticed that in both examples, the clauses were separated by the words when and and. These are called conjunctions. Conjunctions combine words, phrases, and clauses. When you see and, you need to think if it is joining two words. He and she run, or two phrases. She runs in the field and in the forest or two clauses, she runs and she is happy. Latin has these conjunctions too. Et, que, atque, at, and well can all mean and. Well can also mean or, as does out. These words can all join words, phrases, and clauses. Said, which means but, usually joins clauses. We can also have combinations of these. Et et or quequeque mean both x and y. Well well or out out mean either x or y. And non etiam said modo means not only x but also y. There are also subordinating conjunctions that set up different types of subordinate clauses. Temporal subordinate clauses say when something happened. They are introduced by ubi, ut, cum, post, and ante. For example, cum mater vocat illa curit. When her mother calls, the girl runs. The word cum signals that the cum mater vocat clause is subordinate. We know it ends with the verb because of Latin's subject-object-verb word order and because of the comma. Causal subordinate clauses explain why something happened. They are introduced by quod, quia, and quoniam. For example, puella laeta est quod curit. 
the girl is happy because she runs. The quod curat clause is separated by the comma and signaled by the subordinating conjunction. The clause also explains why the girl is happy, namely, because she is running. There are also concessive clauses that are introduced by quam quam. A concessive clause explains that even though one thing is happening, the action of the main clause still happens. For example, quam quam puella cum patre remanere voluit in agro cucurit. Although the girl wished to remain with her father, she ran in the field. Other clauses explain where something happened, and they are introduced by ubi, librum in wainit ubi ke cedrat. She found the book where it had fallen. How do we know where the subordinate clause begins? We know because of ubi. Not all subordinate clauses will be marked off by commas, especially if they follow the main clause. There are also relative clauses. They can be introduced by the relative pronoun qui qui quod, meaning who or which. Nullus puero qui lupum clamavit created it. No one believed the boy who cried wolf. They can also be introduced by correlative conjunctions like tum cum, then when, or ibi ubi, there where, or tantus quantus, which together mean as much as, or as big as. For example, ibi stant ubi usi sunt. They stand there where they have been ordered to stand. This may sound a little weird in English, so you could adjust the translation to they stand in the place where they have been ordered. You will almost always have to adjust tantus quantus sentences so that they sound better in English. For example, Idolus gentes tantos libros legunt, quantus poeta clarus scribit. You can translate this sentence literally as, young people read so many books, as many as the famous poet writes. However, this sounds a little clunky in English, so you can rephrase it a bit to be, young people read as many books as the famous poet writes. Often, subordinate clauses require us to adjust our translation to convey a specific idea or grammatical concept more clearly in English. This is especially true of the subordinate clauses that contain subjunctive verbs. You will learn about each use of the subjunctive mood separately, and they will each be discussed in their own video. For now, remember to use these three strategies so that you're using only the words from each clause to translate that clause.